We want to uh, welcome you to uh, joining us on part two of, of our presentation and study. I invite you to, if you're able to, uh, pray with us and as we ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you again for your presence and for your guidance. We just ask now as we do part two of this presentation that you would help my mind, my thoughts, my words. I pray, Father, for the uh, recording, for uh, the editing, everything, and that as the video will go out, that many will find this information and that they will, uh, uh, Lord, be warned and, and the Holy Spirit may be allowed to uh, guide them and direct them and help them to get ready. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as you see that the PowerPoint here, our son in laws in it? Yes. You see Project 2025, as we talked about in the previous presentation, uh, uh, Sabbath laws, climate change crisis, Ladado C 2.0. So these son in laws are, are actually are sooner than what we think and all that. It's much nearer than what we first believed. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, we're told, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written where in the book. So that's what we want. We want to make sure that our names are, are in the land's book of life. We're, we're facing a time of trouble that has never been. And we have to be mentally, physically, and spiritually prepared for this. In Review and Herald, December 11, 1888, we're told a great crisis awaits the people of God. She says, very soon our nation will attempt to enforce upon all the observance of the first day of the week as a sacred day. In doing this, they will not scruple to compel men against the voice of their own conscience to observe the day the nation declares to be the Sabbath. See, through legislation, they will try to enforce it. That's not what God wants. God does not want us to be forced to worship Him. He wants us to choose to serve Him. It, she goes on, she says, In view of this, there must be among God's commandment-keeping people more spirituality and a deeper consecration to God and a zeal in His work that has never yet been reached to hold aloft the banner of God's truth. The law of God, the only standard of righteousness, must be prized in proportion as the professed Christian world manifests contempt for it. So again, you know, we must love the truth. If we don't love the truth, if we're just coming, you know, we've been basically hypocrites and all that, it's not going to do us good. We must love the truth. We must be even willing to die for the truth as well. And going back to Great Controversy, page 688 as we were talking about earlier, this national reform movement that had been taking place in 1864 and after. The uh, writing here says, another announced by the Reverend E.B. Graham is that if the opponents of the Bible do not like our government and its Christian f features, let them go to some wild, desolate land and in the name of the devil and for the sake of the devil, subdue it. So they said, if you don't like us pushing for uh, 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 national Christianity, then go find somewhere else. And it says, and set up a government of their own on infidel and atheistic ideas. And then if they can't stand it, stay there till they die. Very, very uh, powerful statement, isn't it? Hmm. If you don't like what we're doing, go somewhere else and establish somewhere else. Another announced by Jonathan Edwards, DD, is that Jews, listen what he writes, that Jews and all Christians who keep the seventh day, does that include you and I? Yep. Are to be classified at, as atheists and must be treated as for this national reform question, one party with atheists who cannot dwell together on the same continent with the national reform Christianity. So do you see that those that are of the Jewish faith and those who keep the seventh day must be classified and, and marginalized really as well as what um, this Jonathan Edwards was promoting. Look at another one. It says, a true theocracy is yet to come and the enthronement enth of Christ, how? In law and lawmakers, hence I pray 
devoutly as a Christian patriot for the ballot in the hands of who? Women. So a true theocracy, how in the enthronement of Christ in law and lawmakers, they're going to enthrone God by making it a law. And then they left it to in the hands of women as well. In her annual address to the National uh, Women's Council a convention of 1887, Miss Willard said, the kingdom of Christ must enter, listen to what she says, the kingdom of Christ must enter the realm of law through the gateway of how? Politics. So what do you think is going to happen now? Through the gateway of politics. There are enough temperance men in both the Democratic and Republican parties to take possession of the government and give us national prohibition in the party of the near future, which is to be the party of who? The party of God. So they think that what they're doing is going to, that God's going to approve and is going to be part of their party. She says, we pray heaven to give them no rest until they shall swear an oath of allegiance to Christ in how? Swear allegiance to Christ in politics. This is why if you're involved in politics and supporting politics and you're a Democrat or Republican and everything else, you're going to get swallowed up in this and march in one great army up to the polls to do what? Worship God. So they're doing it through legislative means and all. And this should be, again, a warning sign to you and, and to me. So look at this finally. We saw in the Sentinel that was uh, being, that started in 1863, 64, and this was in response to the, the Blair Bill, a son in law that was being pushed, promoted in 1888. But God used a man by uh, A.T. Jones to be able to fight, fight it back by voice and pen and all, as we've been instructed we should do as well. In Testimonies of IA, we're told, and this is a question that I ask you to seriously consider. This is a question that Ellen White is asking us that we need to be serious about. Who can truly say our gold is tried in the fire? Our garments are what? Spotted, unspotted by the world. I saw our instructor pointing to the garments of so-called righteousness, which is what many think is what really it is, is self-righteousness. It's not Christ's righteousness, it's self-righteousness. And this instructor says, or here Ellen White says, stripping them off, he laid bare the defilement beneath. Then he said to me, can you not see how they have pretentiously covered up their defilement and rottenness of character? She, he says, how is the faithful city become a what? A harlot. What is a harlot? What does she do? She sells herself to others. The instructor said, my father's house is made a house of merchandise, a place whence the divine presence and glory have what? De departed. For this cause there is what? Weakness and strength is lacking. This is why we must take these seriously. You know, is our gold tried in the fire? Are we going through trials and tribulations? Are we sounding an alarm? And by sound an alarm, you're going to have pushback. But if we don't sound an alarm now, when are you going to do it? When things are worse, when our freedom of speech is taken totally away? Revere and Herod were told, we have been looking many years for a Sunday law to be enacted in our land. And now that the movement is right upon us, see, look at the date, 1888. Now that the movement is right upon us, we ask, what are our people going to do in the matter? She said, for years we've been looking for a son in law. And now that it was upon them back in 1888, she says, what are our people going to do in the matter? What are, our, what are you going to do right now in this matter? We should especially seek God for grace and power and be given to be given his people now. God lives and we do not believe that the time has fully come when he would have our liberties restricted, she says. The Sunday movement is now making its way in where, how? It's in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whether the undercurrent is tending. They are working, how? In blindness. They do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that have made them a free, independent nation, 
and through legislation brings into the Constitution principles that will propagate papal falsehood and papal delusion, they are plunging into the Roman horrors of what? Of the Dark Ages. If people don't understand this, it will plunge us back into the Roman horrors of how they treated people that were wanting truth. And this is why it was called the Dark Ages, because people were spiritually in darkness. Testimonies, Volume 5, we're told there are many, even uh, of those engaged in this movement for Sunday enforcement, who are blinded to the results which will follow this action. They're blinded by this. They do not see that they are striking directly against religious liberty. There are many who have never understood the claims of the Bible Sabbath and the false foundation upon which the Sunday institution rests. They don't understand. There are many who never understood the, these claims. Those who are making an effort to change the Constitution and secure a law enforcing Sunday observance little realize what will be the result. And she says a crisis is just upon us. The crisis is right here. We're facing it. We should not be negligent to this. And we need to be much aware. We must be much awake to this. And we must be sounding an alarm. And so this is why, again, if you look at this, it says Congress should encourage communal rest by amending the Fair Labor Standards Act to require that workers be paid time and a half for hours worked on what they call it, the Sabbath. That day would default to where? When? Sunday. So this is, again, a movement that is happening quietly but stealthily as well. National, again, the National Reform, as we looked at it earlier, to secure religious amendment of the United States Constitution, they want an amendment change to the establishing, establishment of a religious day of rest and all. And you can see this within this Christian patriots Christian nationalism. This is moving in a, in a great way. This is why the pendulum has gone from one extreme to the other. This is why I want to ask you something. I want you to consider this. In November, I think the 4th of, of 2024, we're looking at an election. Two primary uh, contenders, one, Joe Biden. If he is reelected, what do you think is going to happen in America? The conservatives and all of that, they will probably potentially, don't know, Up, uh, uproar, there will be an uproar, there will be contesting and, and, and uh, destabilization of the United States, um, and much, I think, will happen, maybe violence and all that. Now, let's look at the other scenario. What if Trump is reelected? What do you think is going to happen on the day of the election or even the day of the inauguration? There's going to be anarchy there's going to be violence in the street as well. So either way we go, we're looking at un, an unstable condition in this world. Don't you not believe that Christ is coming soon? We should not be engaged in any of these things, but we should understand and realize, and this is why the importance for us as Seventh-day Adventists, for us as God's commandment keeping people, even if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, you're watching this, we should understand that it is imperative for us to get out of the cities, out of the large cities and all that, get into the country, if you have property to sell, I believe that this is now the time that you need to sell. The market is right because um, I just met with a realtor and they said their inventory is low. It's great for people that own to sell and to be able to get out. Downsize when you get into the country. It's not to, you know, if you're in a... In, in, in a downtown Chattanooga and, and you have a 5,000 square foot home that, oh, I'm going to get in the country there in the Smoky Mountains, and I'm going to have a 5,000 square foot home and everything else. No, it is time for us to get out of debt. We need to downsize. We need to learn how to sacrifice. We don't need to be having expensive vehicles to drive that don't get hardly much gas mileage and everything else. We, may, we must simplify. We must, as, as the Lord directs us and as we should be asking God, God, what would you have me to do is we need to sacrifice by helping to expand the work before it's too late. 
but I'm seeing too many admins that they go from the cities and they go in and buy large homes, large places and everything else. They're not sacrificing anything. They're not willing to grow guards and be self-sufficient because the crisis is, is going to be here and we must be getting ready now. Testimonies volume 5, page 451, we're told, by the degree in enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation, listen, will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When, when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the, of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country, United States, shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the pop propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, she says, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and what? That the end is near. We are seeing that the end is coming Probation for God's people is soon to close. Things are going to get out of helter-skelter. We don't have much time left to get our characters right. We don't have time, much time left to get this gospel of the kingdom without the impairment of our lives. What we must do, we must do quickly. We must get the word out now while we can. We must get the lit uh, literature, the great controversies, the desire of ages, whatever it is that the people may need. We need to have Bible studies. We need, need to use the health message to reach the people. It is the entering wedge. But soon you're not going to be able to do that. And so we must take an opportunity now while there's turmoil, there's de destabilization. Men, hearts are failing and for fear of the, the, of the things that are coming upon the earth. God's people should have, you know, as Psalms 119, 165 tells us, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. We as God's people should be studying the Bible and spirit of prophecy. We should have, have, be, have peace in the midst of a storm to be able to help other people that have not been preparing or have not even had the opportunity to prepare. Desire of Ages, she says, not by the decisions of courts or councils or legislative assemblies, not by the a patronage of worldly great men is the kingdom of Christ established, not by the, this means, but by the implanting of Christ's nature in, the, in humanity through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's how, that's how changing the character, the minds of individuals. Psalms 27 verse 5 says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me where? In his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a what? what? A rock. 1 Timothy 4 1 and 2 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that when in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies how in hypocrisy, having their conscience, what? S seared with a hard iron. It's like the message of volume three, we're told the great issue so near at hand, enforcement of son in law will weed out. Listen, what's going to happen. The great issue, the enforcement of the Son will weed out those whom God has not appointed and he will have a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter reign. As problems increase, there will be separation and unity at the same time. But as we're told, it will weed out those whom God has not appointed and he will have a pure true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter reign. We must be preparing for that. We must be pure. We must be true. We must be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Here's a warning to you ministers that are watching or should be watching. It says, many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of what? False prophecy. This is why part one we talked about. We need to, you know, adhere to the truth. Many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophets, prophecy in their hands, kindled from the, the hellish torch of Satan in our pulpits, not non adventist pulpits, in our Seventh-day Adventist pulpits. She says, some will go out from among us who will bear the ark no longer, but these cannot make walls to obstruct the truth. 
for it will go onward and what? Upward to the end. Whatever you do against the truth or for the truth, it's nothing but for the truth and all. Manuscript release tells us ministers and doctors may depart from the faith as the word declares they will. And as the messages that God has given his servant declare they will, there will be ministers and doctors, you know, the gospel and the health. People, they're advocates, they will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. This is why this is an interesting quote from Mark Twain. And I know some of you may know about some of his, his history, but it's just an interesting quote. It says, America cannot have an empire abroad and a republic at home. You know, many are saying, oh, we're democracy, democracy. No, we're supposed to have been, supposed to have been a republic country, republic state. And this is why it, it is fascinating to listen to hear what is going on around the world. I'm going to quote you and share with you some things that, I, that, that the um, Dutch Prime Minister Gerrit Wilders just recently said addressing his parliament. And I'm only taking the clipping and, and, and the writing from this specific that he was talking about. He was talking about the importance of his um, country, the Netherlands, of what they need, they need to be doing because he saw that the, their, his country is fracturing. And so he points out, there's five points that he, he brings out. He said, one, we must acknowledge that Islam is an influential ideology that fosters hatred and terror. And as a result is not compatible with the values of where the Netherlands. So he's, he's bringing out Islam. And so the reason I'm, I'm sharing this with you is, is as we're reading this, this type of talk will come, be coming against God's commandment keeping people, Sabbath keepers soon, because they will say that we foster hatred and terror, and it's not compatible to United States laws and teachings and stuff. Look at number two, he says. He says, we should close our borders right away to asylum seekers and immigrants originating from where? Islamic countries. We should withdraw from the Shedjian uh, uh, Agreement and reintroduce our own border controls. So he's seeing that while they're making uh, agreements with other countries is not to their be benefit and that they should close their borders and all that because they're being influenced from outsiders. Look at number three. He says, we need to begin by dismantling Islamic institutions like mosques. So do you understand that there, there's a potential that, you know, the United States may look at trying to shut down our Seventh-day Adventist institutions. The sad fact is, though, is that our church is going, moving more toward the government, more toward the other religions and stuff, and they probably won't be because they have duplicated they, they're making an image of the other institutions and stuff. But in this case, this is just kind of an interesting uh, uh, a warning to us. He says, start by closing foreign funded mosques, including those that receive funding from abroad and are under the authority of the Dianet, the Turkish Ministry of Religious Affairs, and not us. So he's saying there's, they're being funded and influenced by an outside country and control, and, and therefore we, we have... We have no influence through that. So that's why they're trying to dismantle these mosques and all that. He said, number four, lock up anyone who threatens or uses violence or deport them from our country. And if necessary, take preventive action against those hundreds of supporters and thousands of sympathizers of the jihadist movement in the Netherlands. So he's, he's dealing a direct blow to them and says, you know, those who threaten and threaten that you and, and they use violence, get them out of here. Look at number five. And he said, in five, chairman requests all schools, newspapers, media to display a Muhammad cartoon in order not to provoke, but to demonstrate that we never give in to threats. Remember, there was some cartoons and some, some newspapers that had and the, the uh, Islam um, Faith got offended by that, and he said, we should, we should display it to let them know that we're not fearful of putting this in 
in our newspaper. He said not to provoke them, but to demonstrate that we, will, we never give in to threats and violence and that we proudly and firmly support our freedom of the Netherlands. And then he said, finally, I have a message for all those Muslims in the Netherlands who do not respect, listen closely, who do not respect our freedom, our democracy, and our core value. He said, I have a message for you. Look what he says. Those who consider the rules of the Quran more important than our secular laws. So can you, can you change that? Those who consider the rules of the Bible more important than our constitution or laws. Look what he says. And there are many of them, 700,000 which is an interesting number because in, in uh, North America, there's over, a little bit over 700,000 Seventh-day Adventists. So just in the Netherlands, there's 700,000 is revealed in the study by Professor Coppens. So they know how many of uh, the uh, Islams that they have in the Netherlands. And he says, and my message to them is get lost. Hmm. Depart to, depart to an Islamic country. Then you can enjoy Islamic rules. Those are their rules, but not ours. This is our country, not your country. So he said, if you can't deal with our laws, then get out of here, leave. And so this should be a, a warning to us. It should wake us up, say, you know, they're seeing, they're going after Muslims right now. When will they come after commandment keepers, Sabbath keepers as well? And this is why there is a push for a universal religion. These universal religions are going to come together eventually. They're coming together right now. We can see the cohesiveness of what, what is transpiring in these other denominations as well. In Select the Message, Volume 3, we're told that the so-called Christian world is to be the theater, uh, theater of great and decisive actions. Men in authority will enact laws controlling the conscience after the example of the papacy. Babylon will make all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Every nation will be involved. Every nation will be involved. Of this time, John the Revelator declares in Revelation 18, 3 to 7, 3 to 7 and Revelation 17, 13, 14 that are quoted, that they have what? One mind. See, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, we're told, let this mind be in you, which was where? In Christ Jesus. We're to have the mind of Christ, the character of Christ. It's like the message of volume three, page 391 tells us there will be a universal bond of union, one great harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Thus is manifested the same arbitrary oppressive power against religious liberty, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience as was manifested by the papacy when in the past it persecuted those who, who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremony of who? Romanism. So these things are going to happen back again. Look at this. This is why they're, you know, the hand across the gulf. Protestantism is stretching their hand ac across the gulf, grasping the hand of the papacy. Protestants shall give the hand of fellowship to the Roman power then there will be a law against who? The Sabbath of God's creation. And then it is that God will do his what? Strange work in the earth. Review and Herald says how the Roman church can clear herself from the charge of idolatry we cannot see. And this is the religion which Protestants are beginning to look upon with so much what? Oh, so much favor. And which will eventually be united with Protestantism. This union will not, however, be affected by a change in what? Catholicism. For Rome says they never change. She claims infallibility. It is who? Protestantism that will change. The adoption of liberal ideals on, the, on its part will bring it where it can clasp the hand of Catholicism. See, uh, adopting liberal ideals. This is where the compromising comes in. If you're liberal, oh, bless their hearts, you know, they're trying to be Christian. Catholicism, brothers and sisters, is not Christian. They're Catholics, not Christian. There's a whole, and we won't get into that right now, but I would encourage you to look it up. And this is why the United States is forming an image of who? 
the Roman hierarchy. In Revelation chapter 13, looking at verses 14 and 15, it says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of who? The beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Should be killed. Now there is a difference, and we won't be able to go into it right now, between in verse 14, where it says an image to the beast, and then in verse 15, an image of the beast. There's a difference of, of those two. When you form an image of the beast, you are reflecting or you're duplicating the original, the beast. You're acting in the same manner and you're doing the same things. An image to the beast is actually le Sunday legislation. So there's two, two things. In Great Controversy, we're told what is the image to the beast and how is it to be formed? The image is made by the two horned beast and is an image to the beast. It is also called an image of the beast. And it says the two horned beast or Revelation 13, 11, 17 makes an image to the beast portrayed in Revelation 13, 1 through 10. Then to learn what the image is like and how it is to be formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her ends. See, the Catholic Church to control of the government during the Dark Ages. So as Protestantism is going to also form an image of the beast, the United States, that the, that the church will control the government here in America. The image to the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism, which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas, dogmas and all. And so this is how this, this image to the beast is formed. Maranatha, we're told the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. This is the test. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive what? The mark of the beast. And this is something we must avoid. We must not uh, accept. We must work against, especially in overcoming sin. This is why when this happens, there will be a national apostasy that will be followed by what? National ruin. Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 977 says, When our nation in its legislative councils shall enact laws to, to bind the consciences of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh-day Sabbath, the law of God will, to all intents and purposes, be made void where? In our land. And national apostasy will be followed by what? By national ruin. Look at this other quote here. Selected Messages, Volume 2, says, It is at the time of the national apostasy when, acting on the policy of Satan, the rulers of this land will rank themselves on the side of the man of sin. It is then the measure of guilt is full. The national apostasy is the signal for what? It is the signal for national ruin. That's why Psalms 3, 68 says, I will not be afraid. This is not the time to be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Verse 7 says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies. Upon the cheekbone thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth who unto who? The Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. 
Selah. And so this is why, again, it's important when our Protestant churches shall unite with the secular power to sustain a false religion, for opposing which their ancestors endure the fiercest persecution, when then will the papal Sabbath be enforced by the combined authority of church and state. This is why there's, that we talked about in, in part one, that they're claiming, proclaiming that there is no separation of church and state. And so by uh, continuously promulgating that, eventually people will start believing it. The more you tell a lie, eventually people believe that is the truth. There will be a national apostasy, which will end, she says, only in national ruin. Bible commentary again says, when the state shall use its power to enforce the decrees and sustain the institution of the church, then will Protestant America have formed an image to the papacy and there will be a national apostasy which will end only in national ruin. You can see this happening over and over and over. And this is why when you look at Daniel chapter 3, when the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were you know, under this trial, we, we read, then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded. There will be a herald by enacting a, through legislation of a national day of rest. It says all people, nations, and languages. First, it will start with America, a national day of rest. Then it will be a global day of rest. It says that, that, at, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, Flute, harp, sapbuck, psalmetry, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So there will be uh, enactments of punishment that if you do not obey what the government through legislation that the, the church, the Protestant church, has forced the state to do then there will be punishment for those that are disobedient. Bible commentary says history will be repeated. False religion will be exalted. The first day of the week, a common working day, possessing no sanctity what, whatever. And this is why when you need to be studying, you need to ask people to read the Bible to find, is there, is there a command for the sanctity you know, of the first day of the week, the Sunday? Has God commanded? Has he sanctified? Has he made it holy? She says, all nations and tongues and peoples will be commanded to worship this spurious Sabbath. The decree enforcing the worship of this day is to go forth to all the world. It first with, it starts with America, and then it goes to all the world. Isaiah 2, 19 through 21 says, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he rises to shake terror of the earth. In that day, a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bass. Those idols and everything won't do them any good to go into the clefts of the rock, ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake what? Terribly the earth. He will rise to shake terribly the earth because he will, the people will know what they have been doing, what they've been trying to enforce is of no avail. This is why, again, another typology is in the case of, of Esther. It says, then Mordecai commanded to, uh, to answer Esther, think not within with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, this is why you cannot hold your peace. You must, with voice and pen, whatever influence you can, we must lift up our voices like a trumpet. Mordecai wrote, Then shall their, their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews. If you won't do it, God will have a people that will arise and they will do the work that God has commanded to be done. Well, rise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? God has called you for such a time as this. New converts that are coming are coming and joining God's true church at the most exciting time, but also the worst time as well. So it, it couldn't get better for them because God is calling us for a work that he wants us to do. We're not to sit in quietude. It says, it is our duty to do all in our power to avert the threatened danger. 
A vast responsibility is devolving upon men and women of prayer. We must be praying earnestly throughout the land to petition that God may sweep back his cloud of, I'm sorry, to sweep back this cloud of evil and give of grace to work for a few more years. The master, we need to ask God, Lord, I know you have the four angels, the holding back the winds to strive. Hold until your people are sealed. Hold as long as you're, you're able to, dear God, until I am sealed, until you're sealed and all, until others that are sealed as well. But I'm afraid, though, we have been praying and, and asking for that, that soon those winds of strive, as we're seeing, those winds of strive are being let loose. It says those who are now keeping the commands of God need to bestir themselves that they may obtain the special help which God alone can give them. They should work more earnestly to delay as long as possible the threatened calamity. We must work and do what we can because one soul is, is worth it all. One more soul and all that. I, my, you know, recently I've been thinking, I can only imagine when the last call the last call of the people to give their, their lives to, to God, who will be that last person to accept his message of salvation? We must earnestly do it now that as many people may answer the call. Let not the commandment keeping people of God be silent at this time as though we gracefully accepted the situation. We No. Well, we knew it's going to happen. We're just going let it, to let it happen and we need to accept it. No. We need to do what we can. She says, we are not doing the will of God if we sit in quietude, doing nothing to preserve the liberty of, liberty of conscience. Fervent, effectual prayer should be ascending to heaven that <clears throat> this calamity may be deferred until, listen, that this calamity can be deferred until we can accomplish the work which has so long been neglected. She wrote, th wrote this in 1889. She said, this work that has been so long neglected, how long have we neglected the work since she wrote this? Let there be most earnest prayer, and then let us work in harmony with our prayers. We shouldn't just keep praying, 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 and never do anything. We need to pray and work, pray and work, pray and work. And while we're working, we need to be praying as well. There are many who are at ease, who are as it were asleep. They say, if prophecy has foretold the enforcement of Sunday observance, the law will surely be enacted. And having come to this conclusion, they sit down in a calm expectation of the event, comforting themselves with the thought that God will protect his people in the day of trouble. But look at this, she says, but God will not save us. If we make no effort to do the work he has committed to our charge, he's not going to save us when we neglect to obey his commandment. And Ezekiel 3, 17 to 11, uh, 21 says, Son of man, I've made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die, where? In his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thy hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered, what? Thy soul. Again, when a righteous man d doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin and his, and his righteousness, which he had done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require where? At thy hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned as thou hast delivered thy soul. So, so the warning is, is to warn the wicked and to warn the righteous. We cannot just sit in quietude and thinking we're fine and safe and everything else. As faithful watchmen, you should see the sword coming and give the warning that men and women may not pursue a course through ignorance that they would avoid if they knew the truth. This is why faithful pastors must give the warning. We must be faithful to the charge that God has given it 
instant in season and out of season, re reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. Because yes, the time will come that they will not endure sound doctrine, but we must do the work regardless if we're accept, accepted or not. Regardless of the amount of uh, number of people that come to your church. We're not there for numbers. We're there for people that are hungry and thirsting for righteousness. This is the charge that God has given us. That's why we're to cry, lie, and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and what? The house of Jacob, their sins. We cannot labor to please men who will use their influence to repress religious liberty and to set in operation oppressive measures to lead or compel their fellow men to keep Sunday as the Sabbath. These, she's talking about people that are ministers or as Sabbath keepers to influence others to keep the first day of the week. The first day of the week is not a day to be reverenced. It is a spurious Sabbath, and the members of the Lord's family cannot participate with the men who exalt this day and violate the law of God by trampling upon His Sabbath. The people of God are not to vote to place such men in office. See, we're not to be voting. For when they do this, they are partakers with them of the sins which they commit while in office. She says, we're not to vote to place such men in office. We need to stay out of voting in, in the, these political movements and all that. I, she says, I do hope that the trumpet will give a certain sound in regard to this Sunday law movement. I think that it would be best if in our papers, the subject of the uh, perpetuity of the law of God were made a special, I mean, a speciality. We should now be doing our very best to defeat what? We are to do everything we can to defeat this Sunday law. Revelation 13, 11 through 18 tells us, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as what? A dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship what? The first beast whose deadly wound was, was healed. See, th this is the thing is in verse 15, it says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. This power of the United States will give power and give uh, life to the image of the beast that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Killed. This is why eventually there will be a death decree a death decree that will be pushed in, upon the people that are commandment keepers. She says, when our nation shall so abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, Protestantism will in this act join hands with what? With papacy. Protestants will throw their whole influence and strength on the side of the papacy by a national act enforcing the false Sabbath, they will give life and vigor to the corrupt faith of who? Of Rome, reviving her tyranny and oppression of conscience. See, the papacy is sitting there just waiting, waiting to be given the power because she says she's infall infallible. She never changes. And so neither does her punishment for those that will be called heretics, those that will oppose what they're trying to do by taking control of not only the world, but also the conscience of men and women as well. Ellen White wrote in 1905, she says, sooner or later, Sunday laws will be what pass. It will happen, but we are not to just sit and say, well, we knew it was going to happen. We, there's nothing we can do. No, we, we can do everything we can now to warn. Soon the Sunday laws will be enforced and men in positions of trust will be in, embittered against the little handful she says the little handful of God's commandment keeping people. So they won't be embittered. They will be like a, a sore th uh, 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 thumb and all that. They will be, um, <clears throat> these commandment keepers will be a threat to these that want to enact and force people to worship on a false spurious Sabbath. This is why, again, we need to understand the times that things are, that are coming. This is why it's important for us to realize it, that we need to get in the country. Because here in this um, uh, clipping, the Science Daily says, food from urban, listen closely, food from urban agriculture has carbon footprint six times larger than conventional produce. So what they're advocating here in this article is that those that are growing their garden are damaging 
the planet because they actually contribute to more carbon than if you go to a conventional or large uh, companies that are growing that uh, either in gr large greenhouses or in large uh, fields and everything else. So this is a kind of to me is a, is a warped thinking. And so if you have a garden like this, you're creating more carbon um, damage to the, the atmosphere than from large corporations that are producing this in, in mass, mass amount. This is why here, if, when you see at the World Economic Forum that just recently happened in Davos, this, this woman and also this woman were advocating the importance of and kind of insinuating that, you know, we have laws for people that commit mass murders. And that's what this, this lady actually says. She says, we have laws for people that commit mass murders, but we have no laws for people that are growing their own gardens and they're actually damaging and hurting people that have gardens in, in their backyards and everything else. And she's saying that we should have laws because that is hurting people, that is killing people, and so we should need to be punishing these individuals. Do you see, understand the warpness of these people and where they're get, getting to? And so we, we have this that, that is taking place you know, in, the, in the world. And then you have political corruptions that's taking place. You know, some may see this uh, clipping from Megyn Kelly of, of the corruptions, the bribery for uh, this lady that's uh, running for um, Senate uh, out of Arizona um, and, and uh, how she recorded that, that, that uh, what had, t had taken place. The other concern that I have here is, as uh, I'm just sharing with you, must puts a uh, chip in human brain. Well, one of the concerns is uh, with this chip that, that like this man that has maybe Alzheimer's or other health problems, that the, by putting the chip in the brain, it supposedly in, in, in enables them to be able to control uh, smartphones or control their, their TV from their mind and all that. And so this, it's a neural link to the chip, to their, their different devices. Well, the big concern is what if people can hack into that. They hack, people can hack into other things so they could hack into a brain, somebody's brain and make them do things that they probably would, may not be um, uh, uh, in, inclined to do to begin with. So the, these are things that we need to be understanding and be uh, concerned about that. That is, again, it's a, a form of creating man in our, Im in our image instead of God creating man in his image. This is again another form to me of amalgamation and, and it's very sad. So let's conclude with this spirit of prophecy we're told. She, she says, but if there was one sin above another which called for the destruction of the race by the flood, it was the base crime of amalgamation of man and beast which defaced the image of God and caused confusion everywhere. God proposed to destroy by a flood that powerful long-lived race that had corrupted their ways before him. He would not suffer them to live out the days of their natural life, which would be hundreds of years. It was only a few generations back when Adam had access to that tree, which was to prolong life. After his dis disobedience, he was not suffered to eat of the tree of life and perpetuate a life of sin. In order for man to possess an endless life, he must continue to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Deprived of that tree, his life would gradually wear out. And I believe God is going to end this earth before man gets back to the position of what happened before the flood. May God bless you as you're studying. May God be with you as you're preparing to reflect his character. As you, I encourage you to evangelize. I encourage you, if you to pray if you're, not, if you're in the city to get out in the country. God will provide you a place because there is a lifestyle uh, understanding. It, it, it takes uh, a, a learning how to live in the country, especially away from supplies and everything else. And so there is a learning curve. And I encourage you to go ahead and do that before you're not going to be able to. So shall we close as we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you again for the, the uh, technology to be able to watch and see what's going on in other countries and what leaders and um, the push for these different enactments that the Holy Spirit may uh, help us to understand these things that are taking place. That as Satan is trying to unite his forces, the people of the world that are not wanting to obey you, 
that your people, those that want to reflect your character and go to heaven and to help one another, that we should unite and we should obey you in spirit and truth and the beauty of holiness. So guide and direct those that are watching. Bless everything, Lord, that, and the part that we're working on, Lord, that we can do our part faithfully and consistently. In Jesus' name, amen.